We finished part one discussing guilds, and we pick up here with what might be considered a very uh, special kind of guild, right? So you had guilds for different crafts like shoemaking, uh, ironsmiths, and so forth. You're also going to have guilds that have to do with education in connection with the emergence of universities during the High Middle Ages. And uh, first off, we might begin by noting that the word uh, universitas actually means guild. It's derived from uh, the word university derived from Latin and it's essentially referring to a guild of teachers or students. Uh, particularly if you're talking about what today we would consider to be higher education, people who go on to earn a master's or a PhD. And if you think about it, uh, it actually makes sense. If we think about uh, becoming an educator, particularly in higher learning, that you go through several stages, very much like what we saw with guilds, where you start off as an apprentice, a, a student basically learning from a master, uh, somebody who has a higher degree of learning, eventually becoming uh, the equivalent of a journeyman, someone considered sufficiently proficient to begin teaching individuals uh, at the beginning stage, and then eventually becoming a master. Uh, or in this sense, someone who has a master's degree or eventually a PhD. By the way, the university today, many of the term, terms that we have actually that define one's position within the university are actually a product of the Middle Ages or High Middle Ages. For instance, when we talk about a faculty, uh, someone being a student and the idea that you earn a degree. So the rise of universities actually begins with what were known as cathedral schools in as much as they would have been affiliated with a cathedral. So this starts out around the uh, early part of the 11th century. These are schools that would have been organized by what might be viewed as the kind of secular component of the clergy, i.e. individuals not directly associated with monastic uh, responsibilities that we usually associate with monks. Uh, and their primary purpose would have been to educate individuals affiliated with the clergy, right? By 1100, pretty much every city that had a cathedral had a cathedral school. Uh, and again, initially their main purpose would have been to educate members of the clergy, particularly priests. But at some point they began to attract individuals not affiliated with the clergy, mostly individuals affiliated with the nobility. Uh, and so at some point, the kind of education that's being provided would have been to some degree secular. And by the way, in connection with the cathedral schools, many of the titles that we associate with universities uh, originated, right? Such as chancellor, provost, dean, actually had their origin as officials of cathedral chapters. So at some point, the cathedral schools operating independently of the cathedral, and that is pretty much the line of demarcation uh, in terms of, uh, we can speak of a university emerging, right? It's something independent of the cathedral. Generally, it's considered that the first proper university in Europe was the University of Bologna. Uh, it's a, Bologna being a city in Italy. And this is also kind of where the guild element comes into play. In this case, the students of the University of Bologna formed a guild or universita uh, for their own protection, meaning in a sense also that they would have control of the curriculum. This happened in 1158 and they actually were granted a charter by the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, basically allowing them to manage their own affairs, also to determine how one progressed through the system very much in line with what we saw with guilds uh, in general. Uh, and again, a very important aspect of this is that the curriculum, what is being taught is becoming much more secular. A major aspect of that will be the study of Roman law. And that kind of ties in with what we read in the article by Ben Palmer uh, when they talked about how during the high middle ages you see uh, kind of a rediscovery of Roman law as an area of study, right? But again, part of a much more secular curriculum, a curriculum and this process is going to replicate itself throughout Europe. So just to give one other example, and uh, you know, forgive me if I indulge a bit here, this is the university where I earned my degree in Scotland, the University of St. Andrews, uh, very much following the same pattern, right? So university uh, based in the town of St. Andrews uh, at that time, 
uh, the, the location of a very important bishopric within Scotland, a uh, major cathedral. Uh, so you have, uh, again, kind of the similar point of origin as a cathedral school, but then eventually becoming an independent university uh, that continues to operate until the present. Uh, and this would have happened a little bit later around, uh, around the 14th century. In all cases, you have a, a similar kind of curriculum emerging, right? Curriculum defining the areas of study. Uh, and it, it's going to be organized around what's known as a trivium, uh, which consists of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and a quadrivium, which comprise arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. You might remember we saw the beginnings of this kind of breakdown uh, early on in the Byzantine Empire. And so the idea is that you would have gone there as a student, you would have been lectured to by masters, or, read, or you would have read from texts, and then you would have been expected to, in a sense, uh, articulate what you had learned through what are called glosses, a kind of oral examination, um, which we don't really use today, and the lessons would have been in Latin. Right? So when a student applied for a degree, you kind of had to demonstrate that you had a pretty thorough understanding of what you had learned. Uh, and again, that would have involved a very comprehensive oral examination at the conclusion of your studies. And if you succeeded, if you passed the examinations, you would have earned a degree, uh, either the Artium Baccalaureus, Bachelor of Arts, or the Artium Magister, a Master of Arts. Right, representing two different levels of learning, uh, particularly with the, the latter, the Artium Magister, you would have been licensed to teach. So again, very much kind of replicating the process that we saw with guilds in general, where you started as an apprentice, i.e. student, and then eventually became a journeyman, which in this case would have been the equivalent of earning a Bachelor of Arts, and then finally becoming a master where you actually were licensed to teach. Uh, there is even a higher level if you go on to specialize in a particular area of study, either law, medicine, or theology, after which passing the final oral examination, you would have been granted a doctor's degree, what today we call a PhD. Uh, for instance, uh, something I achieved when I, I graduated from the University of St. Andrews, uh, and that would have given you a much higher ranking. The idea that you were now, uh, you were now qualified to teach uh, as an expert uh, in this highly specialized subject. In line with the secularization of the curriculum, right, the subjects that are being studied, the High Middle Ages is going to see a renewed interest in the works of the ancient Greeks and Romans. During this period, Aristotle's work in particular will be highly influential, uh, particularly his scientific works, which uh, eventually are translated into Latin by the 12th century. We should know also that much of the ancient learning of the Greeks and Romans had been preserved in the Islamic world, had been translated into Arabic and thus preserved. Uh, otherwise, much of it would have been lost. Uh, and then now is going to be translated into Latin and reintroduced to Europe, uh, along with some of the original learning coming out of the uh, Arabic speaking world. For instance, the, uh, that of the philosopher Ibn Rush, known in Europe as Aferos. Right, so uh, this is actually uh, very important to know and very often uh, not highlighted enough. The influence of learning and civilizational developments in the Islamic world during the Middle Ages that at this point is going to be reintroduced uh, to Europe. Some of it reintroduced in the sense that it is uh, the translated works of the classical world, but some of it quite original. Uh, in particular, some very important advances being made in mathematics, uh, might surprise some people to know that the numbering system that we use today, inclusive of the number zero, is coming from the Muslim world. Uh, algebra is actually a mathematics developed in the Arab world. The word algebra actually coming from Arabic, al-jabar. Uh, and then also many medical advances, particularly as pertain to optics and so forth, uh, developments that have been uh, taking place in the Islamic world during the Middle Ages that is now going to find its way into Europe. Pedagogically speaking, in terms of the approach used in order to educate individuals, we see kind of a uh, reintroduction of skepticism, something that would have been much more common back in the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, but kind of the idea that you're not just taking what you receive at face value. Uh, 
right? So this is going to define the philosophical and theological system of education used in med medieval schools, what we call scholasticism. Now, a big part of it, this, by the way, is trying to reconcile faith with reason. But what's very important here is you're not just taking uh, religious truths at face value. You kind of have to demonstrate how there is some kind of rational, uh, logical basis to them. Uh, in terms of the actual method, if you were a student sitting in a classroom, so to speak, it would have basically involved the posing of a question and then the presentation of contradictory authorities around that question, uh, you know, and then discussing different points of view in order to arrive at a conclusion. So it would have been a very rigorous kind of analytical process uh, and probably best summarized by Peter Abelard. Uh, a very important intellectual figure from this period who, who basically stated that by doubting, we come to inquiry. And through inquiry, the asking of questions, we arrive at the truth. So in terms of how religious thought is going to influence one's education during this period, uh, it's going to reflect a kind of new concern, a, a much more kind of deeper, more philosophical approach to theology, trying to understand divine truth. Uh, beginning in the 12th century, theologians are going to really focus on the problem of universals. Uh, that is, they become really obsessed with trying to define certain basic universal truths about the nature of the universe and the nature of reality itself. The big question being, what is real? And in line with this, we're going to see uh, a tremendous amount of influence coming from the ancient Greek world, particularly uh, reflective of the thought of two very well-known Greek philosophers who we've met already, Plato and Aristotle, right? So on the one hand, so from, from these two, you're going to see the emergence of two different schools of thought regarding uh, the nature of reality. On the one hand, you have the realists who, following Plato, maintain that the objects we perceive with our senses are not real, but rather are merely manifestations of universal ideas. And you might remember when we looked at Plato's uh, allegory of the cave, right? He talked about how everything we experience in this reality is a shadowy manifestation of some kind of deeper, more real truth. And so they're kind of building on that idea. On the other side, you have the nominalists who are adherents of Aristotle, who maintain that only individual objects are real. It's a much more what we call empirical approach. If you want to understand, uh, want to understand the nature of reality, you have to look at what you can directly experience in this world, like what you can actually experience empirically in the sense of seeing it, hearing it, smelling it, touching it, things that you can actually measure and experiment with. Uh, universal ideas and concepts are simply names that we give to a bunch of objects uh, or a kind of idea where you know, there seems to be a certain degree of similarity. Right? There is no such thing as the ideal of a chair. There are just simply many individual chairs that we can actually see, touch, uh, we can measure in some fashion, experiment with, uh, but we do perceive that there are certain similarities between all of them, and that gives us the idea that they belong to a category we call chair. But there is no ideal of chair, uh, as, for instance, Plato might imagine, right? The idea that all of these objects we call chair, uh, chairs because in some measure they approximate this ideal of chairness. Right? So two very different approaches uh, that are going to become the basis of a kind of broader debate about the nature of reality. And of course, that's going to tie into uh, what might be considered biblical uh, or religious truths. In some ways, Aristotle's position will emerge as the more dominant perspective. And this becomes very evident by the time we get to the 13th century, where a major preoccupation will be how to harmonize Christian revelation with the work of Aristotle. And a really important individual in that regard, and one of the preeminent intellectuals of the high middle ages in Europe will be Thomas Aquinas, who is going to really work very hard to reconcile reason Right? Basically, what you can, you can experiment with, what you can measure, what you can empirically experience in this reality, reconciling that with revelation, basically what the Bible tells us. Uh, and you know, whether he achieves his goal of, of fully reconciling these two things is debatable, but his, his attempt is very sophisticated, something best represented by his most famous work, the Summa Theologica,
a summa of theology, which is basically a compendium of all the received learning of the preceding centuries, uh, but presented in a way that tries to demonstrate how it is compatible with the Bible, with Christian thought. And as already noted, a major area of study in connection with the emergence of universities during the high Middle Ages will be Roman law. And they will adopt a very, uh, very precisely defined curriculum, a very systematic approach for how to study the law, heavily based on the work done by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian when he basically organized Roman law into the corpus juris uh, civilis. Uh, what's really interesting, right, at some point it becomes more than just simply knowing what the Roman law was, it becomes more important to explain kind of the, the deeper meaning of it, right, the underlying principles, uh, the various legal terms, what they all signify, what it says about the nature of justice in terms of how human beings relate with one another, and related to that, scholars will begin to develop commentaries in systemic a systematic treatises on the legal text, right? Treatises being uh, kind of a deeper, more analytical evaluation of different elements of Roman law. Related to the growing importance of the study of Roman law in the university will be a growing appreciation for the orderliness of Roman law. It becomes kind of an ideal by which to organize society, particularly when compared to European law as it stood at that point mostly consisting of a hodgepodge, you know, just a kind of random mix of Germanic law codes, feudal customs, various urban regulations, many of which didn't make much sense uh, or were contradictory, uh, very, very often with little attempt to provide the rationale for why you should do it. By the beginning of the 13th century, much of this is going to be rejected. Good example would be the ordeal, right? You might remember that where in order to determine innocence or guilt, uh, so you might stick your hand in the fire, the idea that God would protect the innocent and wouldn't allow the hand to burn. That is seen now as being incredibly irrational, and things like that will be replaced by a much more rational decision-making process based on the systemic collection and analysis of evidence. Uh, if you want to demonstrate innocence or guilt, it should be based on evidence-based argumentation, right? That you collect evidence demonstrating the one or the other, and then construct a rational, logical argument, coherent argument, in order to prove uh, the one or the other. And that is obviously much more similar to how we think of the law today, uh, and actually ties in, again, very nicely with the article we had by Ben Palmer. So on the subject of intellectual developments during the High Middle Ages, we might consider some things that are going on in terms of literature. Uh, literature during this period dominated by three forms. Uh, we should note much of this would have originally been presented orally, but at some point some of it is being written down. Uh, and of course your audience would have been very limited. Uh, pretty much the only literate people, those able to read, would have been clergy members, the aristocracy, uh, and then maybe some of the more wealthy commoners who lived in the towns and cities. So the three main forms are troubadour poetry, which is about nobles and knights and usually had to do with the idea of courtly love. You know, some knight uh, devoted to a damsel willing to do anything to win her love. Uh, the heroic epic uh, or chanson de geste, the French term. Probably the earliest example of this would have been the chanson de Roland, uh, the song of Roland, and usually dealing with you know, great heroic battles, uh, also political contests, and so forth. And then finally, the courtly romance, usually composed in rhyme couplets in dealing with romantic subjects. And probably the most uh, famous example of that would have been the story of King Arthur, uh, which became a very popular subject during this period. And then eventually, uh, the stories of other knights will be connected with him, where you end up with, you know, kind of tales of the Knights of the Round Table. And you can still find much of this, by the way. So here we see a, a contemporary copy of the Song of Roland, which originally would have been in a old form of French, uh, here translated into English. Uh, the tales of King Arthur are, of course, readily available. Uh, the original would have been written in Middle English, uh, so that too would have to be translated, very different from the English we use today. Uh, here you see actually a scene from a very important episode in the life of King Arthur, where he is receiving the sword Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake, thus designating him the, uh, the proper heir to the English throne. 
We might finish our discussion of cultural developments during the High Middle Ages by considering architecture. The most important structure from this period, of course, would have been the cathedral. That would have been the dominant structure in any town or city. And of course, one of the things people want to see when they travel to Europe, because uh, they're all, often very, very impressive and very large. So you're going to see a change in the architectural style during the High Middle Ages. At the beginning, it's what we call Romanesque. Uh, so during the 11th and 12th centuries, uh, Romanesque churches were built in a rectangular basilica shape. That was one of the defining features, kind of imitating the, uh, the structure of churches built during the late Roman Empire with one very important innovation. Replacing the flat wooden ceiling would have been a long round stone vault known as a barrel or cross vault that you see uh, illustrated uh, in this photo here, right? And that's very typical of Romanesque cathedrals built during this period. And then towards the end, we have the emergence of Gothic architecture, basically corresponding to two fundamental innovations that basically allow them to build higher uh, and in some ways bigger, right? So the first would have been ribbed vaults and pointed arches that enabled builders to make the churches higher. Uh, primarily, but going higher also meant that you needed more structural support uh, at the foundation. And so that corresponds to the second innovation, flying buttresses, which would have been situated on the outside of the walls, which also, by the way, allowed for a redistribution of the weight of the church's vaulted ceilings, meaning they could build with thinner walls, allowing for more glass, more stained windows. And so just by way of kind of wrapping things up, uh, I thought it'd be nice to look at a few Gothic cathedrals uh, from this period. Here we see the Notre Dame, the main cathedral in France, in Paris, and very prominent would be the flying buttresses, which I think is pretty easy to see how, uh, how they function in terms of providing structural support for the walls. Another really nice example of Gothic architecture would be the cathedral in Milan, one of the biggest cathedrals in the world. Uh, and again, you can see that, uh, you know, when you look at Gothic cathedrals, they are very vertical in structure, right? You know, this kind of idea of everything pointing upwards towards God. Uh, by the way, this cathedral is still being constructed even now. Cathedrals of this magnitude uh, particularly given the intricacy of the stonework, right? And if you get very close, you would see that there are lots of, you know, kind of like uh, design elements, statues, uh, and so forth. Uh, it takes hundreds of years, right? In some cases, it is an ongoing process that continues until now. And finally, wrapping things up with two more cathedrals. Uh, again, Gothic cathedrals. I'll be honest with you, I've totally blanked on uh, the name of the one on the left. Uh, but it's, it's pretty typical of Gothic cathedrals. And, you know, I should note, after you've seen quite a few, they do start to look a little bit similar, but I, I never grew tired of visiting them. The one on the right, in fact, very impressive. This is from the city of Cologne in present-day Germany. Uh, double spires. It's kind of hard to get a sense of just how large and high it actually is from this photo, uh, but it is rather impressive. And I should note, in every case, you do have the opportunity to go to the top, but there are no elevators. So best make sure you're in top shape before you attempt it uh, and that you don't get vertical very easy, uh, easily. There are very narrow stairs and uh, not a lot in the way of safeguards as you climb to the top. Uh, one last thing, just in case you're wondering about the name of the city, Cologne. Yes, that does correspond to the uh, liquid product that uh, men often uh, splash on their face uh, if they want to smell nice, particularly after shaving. Uh, it comes from there. Uh, in, in German, the name of the city is Köln, and the name of the product would be Kernwasser, as in water from Köln. Uh, but in any event, that is a bit of an aside, and we now conclude our lecture on the High Middle Ages. And as usual, please make sure to uh, look at and respond to the lecture-based questions on the worksheet.